Hi, and welcome to Dockside with Deb. In this weekly show, we'll talk to people who are doing some pretty cool things in sailing and experts in their field. I'm Deborah Diel, sailor, founder of MySail, and your host for today. Dockside with Deb is recorded live, so you can join in and ask your own questions. To find out more, head to mysail.team slash Dockside with Deb. Let's get started. Uh, so I want to give Lisa a little bit of an intro first, because uh, if you don't know her history or anything about her, she is um, quite an amazing woman. Um, first woman uh, to sail solo around Antarctica. Uh, she ended up with one stop. It was supposed to be a non-stop trip, but we'll, uh, I'll let Lisa tell that story as we get into it. Um, first woman solo, non-stop, and unassisted around Australia. Um, she put together an all-female team for Sydney Hobart in 2017. Uh, she did um, all-female double-handed team from Melbourne to Hobart this year that just passed. So first all-female double-handed team. She's currently writing a book. Uh, she's a film um, on the go, and she teaches sailing in her spare time, which I don't know how she has any spare time. Um, and also a really passionate advocate for climate action. So. Before Lisa starts, um, I thought I'd share this intro to her video that I came across. Um, so give me one second and I'll share my screen with you. All right, sharing my screen and I will just play this video so that you can take a look at some of the what she's done. When you're out there on your own, there's nobody else you can rely on. You're so far from help. From what I could tell and my meteorologist and, and my other advisors could tell, the swell was going to be a little bit bigger and the storms were going to be more frequent. I thought I had ticked every box, I thought, I, and I had. I'd done everything I could possibly do to make it safer, but it didn't change the fact that I was still throwing in that life or death situation. <laughs> everything was like mounting up. And after five days of just extreme sleep deprivation, I just felt like I couldn't keep going. I felt like the world was telling me not to go and I started listening to those doubters and I started listening to the, to the naysayers that were saying, don't go, you can't do it. I'm so close to home. I have to step up. I have to figure out a way. I have to make it work. Captain's been demolished because I've just been ripping stuff apart. I just can't go through it again. If you haven't prepared for something, if you haven't thought about all the risk, if you haven't thought about all the scenarios you might encounter, then you're not going to succeed out there. All right. Well, it uh, looks like oh, nice. just got some Somebody else just joined. JT, thanks for joining us. Um, we're just going to put you on mute there so that um, we don't get any background noise. And I'll just stop sharing my screen. So what did you guys, I hope you enjoyed that. And now we'll pass it over to Lisa to, um, uh, yeah, answer a few questions about some of the stuff that she's done. So first, Lisa, I'll just start. What actually sparked your idea for that trip that you did around Antarctica? Um, well, first. So yeah, I just want to say hi to everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today for a bit of a Q&A session. And I hope that everybody deal with your... Um, also, I don't know how it was for you, Deb, but the video that was just played was a bit jumpy for me. Uh, so if it was like that for you, you can actually find that video uh, on the homepage of my website, which is Lisa Blair Sales the World. So uh, you can check it out there if it was a bit sketchy for you um, as it was for me. I also apologise, I've got really low internet at my house, uh, so it does uh, sort of might skip a little bit, so just kind of bear with me uh, on that. And back to the question. Uh, so Antarctica was uh, a little bit of a 
development. It didn't kind of happen overnight. It was basically a few years in the making of me trying to come to the point where I realized I might be capable of something like that. And that's quite a journey that you go on. And um, I don't know how many people who have joined us know this, but I actually only started sailing when I was 22. So I had been sailing for a little over a year when I signed up to do the Clip Around the World Yacht Race and raced around the planet. And I had zero dollars when I signed up. I did it all through sponsorship or fundraising. Um, and I went and raced around the world. And I remember finishing that trip and just going like this moment where I kind of was like, well, hang on. Uh, a couple of years ago, I'd never even sailed on a boat. And now I'm a circumnavigator. What else could I do? And what else was kind of possible? And, and that sort of stemmed into me wanting to do solo sailing because I couldn't see a harder way to test myself with sailing than to do it on my own, to go and face all the storms that I'd sailed, uh, you know, with all the crew around the world uh, and, and actually go and tackle those challenges completely on my own. So I did the Trans-Tasman Yacht Race and uh, as I was trying to convince a complete stranger to lend me his boat to sail to New Zealand solo uh, when I'd never sailed solo before, uh, he sort of threw out this idea that maybe if I combined it with a bigger project, I might have a more of a chance to get the sponsorship and the funding together and actually and, uh, I never got the sponsorship before and I managed to do the race, uh, but the idea was kind of stemmed from that one conversation. and. He had kind of thought about this idea of Antarctica himself with his boat, but then he met a lovely lady, had kids, and it's never sort of taken off, but his boat was more than capable of doing it. And uh, so he sort of threw the suggestion to me, and I, my instant reaction was absolutely no way. It's the Southern Ocean. Uh, I'm five foot two. I, uh, I'm not exceptionally great at anything, uh, and it was this crazy idea. But the kind of idea was there and, it, and I went away and I thought about it for several months and I did a lot of research on islands and where the iceberg line was and how cold was cold and would I get ice on the decks, was it going to be freezing, like, you know, what were the conditions really going to be like? And, uh, and then I was racing the New Zealand solo for that Trans-Tasman yacht race and I remember asking mum before I left for the race, I said, oh, so what do you think about this idea of me sailing around Antarctica solo? And, uh, and mum was just a flat out, absolutely no way. Uh, <laughs> you're mad. That's not going to happen. I'm not going to let you go. And then I raced this boat solo to New Zealand and back. And at the end of that, I asked her again. I said, so what do you think? Like, you know, how do you feel about that Antarctica idea? And, and uh, yeah, came back and she was, oh, you're solo, so, you know, you've got to have some idea of what you're getting yourself in for. And uh, and that was kind of the beginning. So it took me three and a half years to get from that moment and I actually left for the record. So it was quite the journey. I don't know. Um, I can't hear you at all, Deb. Sorry, I muted myself so that I wouldn't disturb you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, you you mentioned. I'm going to throw a couple of curveball questions in here. You mentioned that it took three years. Does that include the Trans Tasman planning as well? The Trans Tasman trip? No. No. So that was after Trans Tasman. So, um, oh, actually, it was. The moment I kind of mentally made the commitment was just before I did the Trans-Tasman and I quit all my jobs and everything to make that project work and then I figured if I was ever going to make Antarctica work, I needed to move to where I'd be able to have a better chance at sponsorship and uh, in 2014, I made the move to Sydney and so that was when I started getting serious about the idea and I eventually left for the record in 2017 in January. So yeah, three years. Okay, wow. And tell us a bit more about what went into the planning around the, the solo Antarctica trip. Three years is a long time, so there must have been um, a lot of... Yeah. Oh, I went into that. 
Yeah, I think uh, a lot of it was, uh, well, the biggest chunk of it was really trying to work out how to fund a project that and what kind of cost was going to be associated with that. I didn't own a boat. Uh, any boat I got, I would need to replace all the systems on me. So that's new rigging, new sails, new electronics, overhaul the hull and decks, all new hardware, upgrade everything, beef it all up, be able to withstand the conditions down there. So a boat that was available secondhand on the market would have been in a position to actually deliver that. Um, any boat I bought, I would be looking to replace all of those things so that I could actually make sure that the trip was going to be as safe as possible. But before I could even think of those things, I had to work out how I was going to fund the boat. And um, I was working five different jobs in Sydney just um, as a sailing instructor or as a charter skipper or driving the American Cup boats in the harbour, um, doing, you know, the hospitality kind of wine and dine tours. And uh, and I would work five, like, all day, and then I'd come home and I'd work on the project in the evenings and I'd be, you know, writing sponsorship proposals and sending them out and on days off or gaps between sailing trips, I would be on the phone to sponsors trying to lock in meetings and, and trying to work it out. I had very little success with a lot of that and it wasn't until I actually got to meet Dick Smith and that it all kind of changed. And I had postponed the trip two years in a row and I was coming up to the point where I was going to postpone it again and I had had a conversation with mum about postponing it and I was like, well, it's not the end of the world. I'll just go and do something else and come back to this when I've maybe raised my profile a bit more and I'm in a better position to actually raise that kind of sponsorship. And uh, and she went away and looked at her finances and thought she could potentially help me finance the boat. So we had a few discussions around that and then started boat shopping. So kind of a chicken and an egg factor with projects like this because people won't sponsor you unless you've got the boat but the boat without the sponsorship so it kind of you kind of handicapped from the get-go uh, but once I got the boat in the boat and we did the Sydney to Hobart and uh, and then I got to meet Smith and take him sailing and and basically kind of build that profile and that relationship and and he ended up coming on board as one of my main sponsors and um uh, then the hard work started, and that was the, the trying to make sure the boat was at the right level, and, and that was a complete, a huge, huge, huge amount of work. And, and I had, I don't know, there must have been 50 different volunteers from Sydney itself work and donate a couple of hours painting floorboards or sanding stuff down or prepping surfaces for fiberglassing or um, unloading or onloading or helping me store stuff. So it was just a huge amount of work went into it. Um, I'd also had the fortunate opportunity to meet a guy called Jeff Dauncey, who became a massive part of the project. And he uh, owns Australian Maritime College, and they do uh, sort of powerboat licenses, and he's a master for driver out of Brisbane. So he got involved, and he helped more with the planning of the passage planning side of things. He helped me order all the charts and stuff. And um, and we came up with a 30-page document, which was my passage plan for the voyage. And uh, and that highlighted, I mean, most of the voyage is open ocean, but it highlighted, you know, exits, of course, known kind of distances or um, unknown reefs and things like that. Uh, and it also highlighted uh, points of rescue uh, and, and points of sort of areas that I could go and hide. Um, so we put that together. I ended up getting ten thousand dollars worth of paper charts, just paper charts. Um, so if each chart's thirty-five dollars, that's a whole lot of charts. Uh, and then I had to go through every chart and actually overhaul the charts and, and get my head around what the what the hazards were coming up. Um, and then I cross-referenced my paper charts with my electronic charts to make sure on the electronic charts was accurate. Um, and that there wasn't, you know, an island on the paper chart that wasn't showing up on my electronic chart or a rock that was just randomly in the middle of the ocean. Um, so that was all happening and reasonable, which was just huge amount of work. And it was me, a friend of mine, Yvette, who's a very skilled shipwright, and it was basically the two of us building the boat and doing what we could do and then getting technical support in uh, by shipwrights or riggers, etc. Uh, you know, where and when was needed. 
and I feel like we did maybe a six month refit in six weeks, absolutely no sleep. But uh, unfortunately, with a lot of these things, sponsorship doesn't come until last minute, and, and then you're up against a huge deadline to try and make it work. And I had a very seasonable um, window I had to do the project in, so I was pushing against deadlines the whole way through. And uh, and yeah, but it, it, we pulled it off, and uh, and then I had to sail the boat 2,000 miles to Sydney, uh, sorry, to Alpha. I used as my training voyage on the trip. Um, so before that voyage, I had only sailed the boat from Newcastle to Sydney and then Sydney to Hobart in the race and then back to Sydney. And I'd done all of that with the crew and I hadn't actually sailed that boat solo. And uh, it was quite interesting because I theory that you could sail a 50-foot yacht solo and theory that I could do it, uh, but I hadn't actually put that theory into practice yet because the boat wasn't set up for it at the time. It didn't have reliable autopilots or the way the cockpit layout was. It wasn't sufficient for solo sailing. So as we modified a lot of those systems or upgraded them or changed them um, to allow the boat to be set up for solo sailing. Uh, so my friend Yvette sailed with me from um, Sydney to Eden. And then I spent my birthday in Eden because there was a big storm. And then I set off from Eden on my own and sailed from Eden to Albany in Western Australia over two weeks. And uh, in the Great Australian Bight and just uh, put the boat through its paces, which was really good to, to do because I wanted to go through bad weather and make sure that I was comfortable with how she sits in the bad weather and, and how she's going to react to those mega storms that are in the Southern Ocean. So, yeah, and then there was another month of refit work to do in Albany, just tidying up all the loose ends to keep milk bottles, and we ended up collecting 1,200 milk bottles uh, in netting in the voids at the very front of the boat, so the collision compartment, um, because my risk was iceberg collision that the – the ice would rupture a hull and then I'd lose my positive buoyancy and I wouldn't be able to make repairs and get to shore. Um, so instead I tried to trap air in plastic containers and, and stow them in the compartments as a way of trying to create that positive buoyancy but still have access to that compartment if I needed it um, so that I could make repairs. So, yeah, a lot of time visualising and dreaming and just kind of thinking about every possible worst-case scenario, everything that's likely to break on the voyage, everything that's unlikely to break on the voyage, what's can I make it safer? Um, you know, what's my risk management for me going to be and the boat and then obviously the shore-based support side of things. So, uh, yeah, that's why it was three and a half years. <laughs> yeah, well, there's like it sounds like a ton of work and obviously it was and some creative solutions with plastic bottles <laughs> and I'm glad it did, didn't yeah. come to that for you but um, uh, we did have a question um, in the chat so I'll just let you know one I'll get back to you on that um, and we will answer your question um, but before that I just want to go through especially after you just told us about your three and a half years preparation and how well you know how much preparation went into this um, but you did have an issue in the Southern Ocean south of Cape Town, didn't you? So instead of me explaining what that is, I'll let you explain what that is. But maybe also, you know, if you could tell us that story, but also kind of how you dealt with that and how you felt and everything, I think especially being on your own and having to go through something like that is would be really hard, so. Yeah, well, it's plan to be a solo for four months. So you can't do a voyage like that in that kind of ocean where you're in the roaring 40s and the purest 50s and the screaming 60s for such an extended period of time without having lots of things going wrong. Um, the boat is kind of breaking apart around you and you're constantly repairing things and, and, and it's this running maintenance that you have to do on the boat after the voyage, just rebuilding the generator. Um, but... Uh, most of the things were fairly surface and expected to break at some point in the voyage because of the wear and tear of the boat. Uh, but unfortunately, um, the situation Deb's referring to is my demasting, uh, which was not a fun day at sea. So uh, I'd been sailing for 72 days 
and I had sailed from Albany in Western Australia straight south, 45 degrees south, and I had this kind of racetrack line at 45 um, that was my entry point into the world record. So I was sticking between 45 degrees south in the Southern Ocean. And just for a mental reference for people, south is around the tiny bit below the southern tip of Tasmania, and uh, 60 degrees south is roughly the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, so if you imagine that band of ocean coming through, that was where the voyage was. And um, so I'd sailed south. I'd gone across the South Pacific, uh, around Cape Horn, and across the South Atlantic, just past the Cape of Good Hope uh, of South Africa. Uh, but I was a 1,000 nautical miles directly south of South Africa. So it was like a tiny little dot in the middle of a great big ocean. Uh, but that was my new time. And uh, it was – the South Atlantic was pretty well one big storm. Um, it was what you would consider gale winds would be like a nice sunny and then you would have the bad days. Uh, so it was kind of a storm front. Every two or three days would come through, but the gaps in between would still be – 30 to 40 knots of wind, um, you know, air temperature of 6 degrees or 2 to 6 degrees and a sea temperature of around 5 or 6 degrees. So um, it's pretty brutal conditions and I had been super I was sailing the boat uh, as part of my risk management because I knew that I was having to be at sea for four months whilst I was also challenging the men's rep to make sure that but if you don't finish, then you don't get anything. And I'd seen so many people do these types of records and come unstuck because they push too hard. And then they can um, really take the option of having a, a very fast boat and sailing it very conservatively and very slowly. So I was going to the point where even in 15 knots of wind, if I knew that there was another frontal system coming through, I wasn't even bothering to change the sails because the conditions were just not stable at any point. You would get winds at wind for half an hour and then a 40-knot bus would come through and then it would drop off to 10 knots and then a 40 knots and then it would build up to 30 knots and hold at 30 knots for a couple of hours and then it would ease up. Like there was just nothing consistent about the conditions. Um, but that night, facing two, I uh, was just entering the South Indian Ocean. So I was anticipating that it would be four weeks until I got back to Australia uh, at the current speeds that I'd been able to maintain and the current weather patterns that I was expecting. So I was looking forward to the end of the voyage. And uh, at about 6 p.m. at night, I'd been catnapping during the day because I do 20-minute micro sleeps and I get maybe 40 minutes or an hour here or there, depending on what's happening with the weather and the boat. Uh, so it's lots of little baby sleeps rather than one big sleep. And uh, I heard a bang, and it was just this massive metal ringing kind of noise. It sounded like a gunshot going off. It was just this one loud crack. And um, I jumped out of my bunk and onto my engine box. And if anyone's seen a photo of my boat, I've got – this kind of perspex dome on the cabin top, and it's, um, it's so that I can keep a good lookout without having to go outside of the boat all the time because it's freezing cold outside. Um, so I heard the crack, jumped up onto my engine box, and initially I thought that my running backstay line had snapped. And uh, for anybody who doesn't know, that a piece of rigging wire that goes from the top of the mast uh, down to the back of the boat, but it's a removable piece, it's like a rope, and so I thought that that had snapped. And so I looked at the back of the boat and uh, it was there. It was fine. It was, it, it, I realized that something else had broken and I looked at the front of the boat and I just saw my mast just like kind of jellying like a hula girl shaking at hips and completely unsupported. And it was just that moment where I realized I'd snapped. And in my head, I'm going, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit. This is not good. This is not good. This is not good. At the same time, I'm reaching for my life jacket on, and my intention was to go out on deck and quickly throw a tack in, like an emergency crash tack, and try and get the wind on the other side of the mast and the sails. 
And at the time I had sort of and six to eight metre waves, um, so pretty big swell, but they were big ocean swells, so they were fairly far apart at, the, at that point. And uh, before I got the chance to get on deck, I kind of and started to climb out of the hatch, and just as I did that, I heard the mast snap. Um, and it was this, I don't know, there's no words that can kind of describe it because it's just so definitely loud inside the boat because I'm inside still, so everything's amplified in the cabin. Um, you don't know what's happening. You're just hearing everything get ripped apart. It's metal on metal, like twisting and grinding, and the whole boat, all the rigging has been holding the boat kind of tense and it's just instantly let go, so the whole boat's twisting and shuddering and shaking, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's something I hope none of you ever have to go through. Um, I just demastered, and uh, and I prepared for a demasting, and I had planned for a demasting. Um, I'd replaced all my rigging wire before I left. So the rigging wire piece that snapped was four months old, um, so it was pretty well brand new, and it had snapped on me. Um, and I had gone through all the kind of theory of it all, but I, I still don't think much of that really prepares you for the moment. And, uh, you know, I'm on my own. My mast is 22 metres long, so it's this 22-metre-long spear that's potentially going to, you know, hold the boat. And uh, at the time, I was a 1,000 nautical miles from land, so... It's probably as crisis a situation as you can kind of get on a boat without taking on water, um, you know, as a solo sailor. So uh, it ended up being a night from hell, and uh, you can hear more about that in the documentary or the book. Uh, but basically I had to try and separate the the mast from the boat, and, and I had to do it before it had a hole in the boat. And the, the way the mast had snapped, it had snapped it level so um, where it would normally go from the keel up through the deck it snapped right at the deck there and so the whole section of the top section of the mast had fallen across and that meant that uh, it was all held by the ropes still at the deck there all the reefing lines and everything that runs all the halyards that run through the mast were keeping it kind of attached um, but I had these sort of six to eight metre breaking waves coming through and the tops of these waves, they kind of go like a mountain, but the very tip of the wave would get pushed by the wind and it will curl and it will create kind of like a metre or two metres of white water just at the crest. And so as the waves pass under you, the crest has so much force behind it because you're at the peak of the wave and then you get hit by the crest and it kind of throws you to the bottom of the wave. And uh, they say one square metre of white water is one tonne of pressure applied um so if you're thinking a, a two meter wave but that's five meters or ten meters long uh impacting the boat and the forces of that so the sail and everything when it broke in it had turned into an anchor and actually kind of turned the boat 180 um not to my knowledge but it, it happened and then suddenly the mast was on the sort of windward side of the boat so as these waves were coming through they would hit the mast first and they were driving it up onto the deck of the boat, and then the, the like of the wave would kind of pull it back again. And so it's creating this kind of seesaw motion of this push shove from the waves. And I was also effectively now anchored side on in the middle of storm conditions. So the waves were really kind of underneath me. They were breaking pretty well straight across the top of the boat. Uh, 30 seconds to a minute, you would have this breaking wave impact the boat, and I'd be at least up to my waist in white water, um, if not up to my neck sometimes, because I'm kind of crouched on the deck there. So you're getting kind of a metre of water across the deck, which is pretty powerful as well, and you're trying to hold on to tools and the boat and, you know, all of those things as well and keep yourself attached. So... Um, I decided in my preparation that I, I I did all the normal things. So I had um, bolt cutters. I had a battery-operated angle grinder with a cutting blade. And I also put together what I call a demasting kit, which is a, a hot pink pencil case so that I could see it easily. And in it I had um, just some tools I thought would be useful for trying to separate the mast from the boat, um, to knock out the pin that joins the mast to the boat and knock out the clevers pin. 
Um, so in that, I had a hammer, a flathead screwdriver, a pair of needle nose pliers, and um, four pairs of multi grip. And so I grabbed my uh, bolt cutters and my demasting kit, and I went to the back of the boat first. Um, at this point, you know, I'm a couple minutes into this emergency. I'm really in the panic station mode still. I'm not thinking clearly. The adrenaline's firing, and all I can hear is this crumbling, grinding noise of this mask getting shoved back and forth and the waves bashing over and, and me knowing that kind of at any point that mask can kind of tear off the deck of the boat and then pierce the hull of the boat. So I'm very conscious that my time is quite limited. Um, I went to the back of the boat and I started trying to separate the backstay wire from the deck of disconnect the, the, the joining pin, the clevis pin, joining pin, and knock, but I was shaking so hard and uh, my adrenaline was just firing. I wasn't really thinking that clearly and the line now wasn't under load anymore so the, the split pin wasn't kind of firmly held in place. So every time I tried to get the screwdriver in and I tried to hammer it, I was hammering my hand in and it just kept rotating and it just wasn't working. Um, and after about 15 minutes of panic stations trying to smash this thing and just smashing myself up, I bailed on it and I went back below uh, and started just ripping across my toolbox because I was thinking to myself, there's just got to be something better. Um, the bolt cutters didn't even make a dent in the wire and uh, I couldn't get the, the split pin mode was going to be too slow. And I couldn't use the angle grinder because the amount of water coming over the boat. So I was really just kind of, that would help me get these split pins, split pins out quickly. And I wasn't really thinking that rationally yet. And so it was at that moment that I thought I should probably tell somebody, you know, uh, I'm kind of fighting for my life here and I haven't even told home. Uh, so I called my shore manager, Jeff, in Australia, and it was 3 o'clock, 3 a.m. in Australia, so he was in bed, and, um, and I woke him up, and I told him that I demastered, and I issued a pan-pan. Uh, now, I didn't issue a mayday. There's a very clear reason why, and it was purely because of the fact that it would probably take two to three days for somebody to reach me anyway, and if I issued a mayday then, and then was able to resolve the situation, they could require to abandon my boat anyway because I had issued a mayday. If I issued the Pan Pan, um, I could upscale it to a mayday quite easily and quite quickly. But at that present point, my mast was snapped, but my so I was in effect still, you know, okay. And given the length of time it was going to take for someone to reach me, I decided to go for the Pan Pan option. Um, so I issued a pan pan and I went back to carry on. Uh, it took me about two hours to get the back stay free and the inner force stay free. And then I started trying to work on the force stay. And I worked out that the way the rigging had fallen, um, it had kind of trapped the split pin underneath uh, the, the furling drum and I wasn't able to reach it. So I had one option of of wedging my arm underneath and using my other arm over the top with my hammer and my split pin and everything. Uh, but the minute it pulled free, it would probably crush me in amongst the fittings with the forces of the water and, and the way the rigging and everything was moving. Uh, and the, the alternative option was to climb over my safety rail and sit down on the bowsprit at the front of the boat and, uh, and try and approach it from there. It's because of the nature of the angle of the way it had broken, but I knew going out onto my bowsprit in those conditions uh, was a high risk that I'd get washed off the bowsprit and into the water, and I'd been exposed to freezing conditions at well over two hours, so I was already showing the early signs of hypothermia, feeling in my hands and my feet. Um, I was starting to get kind of drowsy and worn out, and I was really kind of coming down hard, so I was kind of was of the essence, and um, so and so my bow rail, like all my railings on the starboard side, were ripped off or flattened by the demasting, so there was no security on that side of the boat. And the way the bowsprit itself had fallen, it had kind of ripped to the side, 
and I was only holding on by like four and the rest of the railing fitting had actually been ripped clear uh, and I had a high probability that when I let go of the four stay it would actually rip the rest of the railing off with it uh, and that would probably be the only thing that I was able to bear. So um, yeah, it, it, put it mildly, it wasn't a pleasant evening uh, but I had to make a decision on whether I sing and abandon to the life raft because that was probably what was going to happen if I couldn't separate the mast. I had sort of a 30 centimetre hole uh, at the deck hull joint where the mast is kind of quickly cutting through the deck now because it's gotten through the top two layer of glass. Um, or do I climb out there and have a shot of saving the boat? And if I lost in the conditions that I was in, the location I was in, the amount of exposure I'd already um, subjected myself to, my chances of survival were pretty well nim, like nil, uh, especially given that it would take about three days for any sort of rescue to reach me. Uh, best chance of survival was exploding. Um, so to do that, I had to come with it. Maybe I won't make it out of this alive. Um, and I might not get past the next five minutes if I climbed out on that power grid. Uh, so it was pretty confronting from that point of view and obsessed. Um, rather than it being this kind of distant future thing that you think about with saline, you're like, oh, yeah, it's, a, it's an accepted risk because I'm doing something that I love. And I had chats with my family before departure about, you know, maybe I won't come home and, and how's that going to affect you and, are you going to be okay with that and and all of these kind of conversations but it, it's very different talking about it and actually being faced with that kind of process that you've got to go through. Um, I called Jeff again and gave him an update before I went out and I just put him on alert that I was climbing out over this rail and I was going to be completely exposed to these, you know, six to eight metre breaking waves and my chances were maybe 50-50 that I'd come back in. If my, my PLB, my personal location, my life jacket is triggered, uh, it's because I'm in the water and that's kind of the only way to say goodbye, you know, that that's what's happened. Um, so we had this conversation. I hung up the phone and I went back to the front of the boat and, you know, you're on your hands and knees, you're crawling, you've just got the head torch, it's the middle of the night, pouring rain, there's waves buffeting, um, you know, and I got within like two metres of the bow and I just remember completely freezing in fear and just going through that process of there's got to be another way, there's got to be a safer option, there's got to be a tool I haven't thought of, there's got to be something else that I could do to actually not have to do what I'm going to do next as if coming back so slim. Um, and I just remember I couldn't come up with another way else. And uh, after about 20 minutes of trying to go through it again, I just was like, got to do it and uh, made the split second choice to do it and stood up and I climbed over the rail and I sat down and I um, started trying to separate the mast um, or the force stay from the boat at the front of the boat and I had kind of my screwdriver in my left hand and I could hold the rail that hand and the screwdriver but I had my hammer in the right hand and I couldn't grip the rail and the hammer at the same time so I had only kind of one hand to hold on to and the strength of my legs and you would kind of look up as a six meter wave, it's like a two story building kind of thing. Yeah, six to eight meters, it's about a two story house coming at you. And so you kind of look up at these waves and you can see the, the sort of white water and you can see it coming, you can hear it coming as well with just the roar before it impacts you. And I would have to just see it coming, grip the boat and kind of hook my elbow around the rail and hug the boat as much as I could. And it would hit the boat kind of off us and then water would hit and it would roll over the top of you and then on the back end of the wave you would have maybe 30 seconds or a minute where I would be able to let go of the rails, put my screwdriver in the fitting and like kind of hammer with the with the hammer and actually try and kind of knock it free. Um, so I survived. I'm still here to tell the tale and uh, it's been total to separate the rig from the boat and I was <laughs> thermic by then and uh, and yeah and, and I was just absolutely exhausted. But 
to get to South Africa or disasters, building a drew, getting fuel from a container ship, uh, which resulted in a collision 800 miles from land and further damage to the boat. Uh, but I did make it to South Africa, and then I was able to restart the record, which was even more scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you, you got the mast fixed in South Africa and then went back out. Is that right? Yeah, well, the mast was lost, um, so I lost in the Southern Ocean. So yeah, the only thing I was able to keep was the boom. I managed to find a second hand mast in South Africa that had been for like 15 years waiting for me to show up uh, and it fit my boat and it's two meters shorter than my old mast but it's good enough and uh, so I picked it up in Australia and uh, local support and support sponsors I was able to rebuild the boat and get it back out. Gosh, it's quite a harrowing story and it would have been so hard to get back out. And I've, I've actually <laughs> been demasted um, once, which was uh, with a crew of 11 other people just off the coast of Australia. And, and, you know, even that was kind of quite an ordeal. So I couldn't imagine being in the South Southern Ocean and by yourself and in a storm. Um, yeah. Gosh, scary. Yes. Um, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> Uh, and, um, well, one of the other things uh, I wanted to ask you about and kind of, you know, going on from that is that you have spent a lot of time by yourself. And as we know, we're all supposed to be self-isolating now and for an indefinite period of time. And besides not just sailing, that's, you know, it can be quite a lonely kind of hard time for people. So what kind of tips do you have for people um, around, you know, or how did you kind of deal with that self-isolation yourself when you were out um, doing that trip? Yeah, so, um, I mean, it is such a topical question at the moment and um, going through some crisis around the COVID-19 because that can just heighten everything a million times. And, uh, and when you feel trapped in situations like this, small things can start to become big problems and so you really need to address those things early. Um, for me, as a boat, I needed to make sure that I could trust the boat and so I would make sure I had a good routine and I would manage that maintenance on board the boat. Um, I would go through ups and downs when I was out there and I later worked out that it was pretty well directly connected to how much sleep I got um, and if I was tired, I would be more short-tempered and I would be more likely to throw a temper tantrum like a few-year-old because I threw a few of those. Um, and so I found that having a good routine with sleep management would help my overall mood. So if anyone is struggling a little bit, just make sure you do have good habits that you install at home because your um, – you know, you might still be working, you might still be trying to you know, wrangle your kids and things like that, but trying to establish a routine um, is straight up number one because in our normal day-to-day -day, we have a routine. We get up, we go to the gym, we go to work, we come home, we cook dinner with the family. Like there's this kind of schedule with it. So building a routine in your family or your household um, is definitely like something that can really help. Uh, stay connected. Like it, it's for thousand or three thousand miles from land um, but it wasn't until my text messaging capabilities stopped working for like two weeks that I actually felt isolated because I had an Iridium Go so I was able to SMS my friends and my family and I would send position reports and that just that text message back and forth a joke a day getting sent by my sister or, you know, that just made such a difference because I always knew that I could just pick up phone and text somebody. I didn't have to call them. I didn't have to email them. It was just a quick text, but I just knew always that there was somebody there. And then I generally had phone calls once a week with my family. And that for me was enough given where I was going and my mental preparation for it. But in the current climate, I'm actually on a daily phone call with my family because I want to, like, they're up in Queensland and I and I want to check in and I want to make sure that they're okay. My dad's plant 
patient. So he uh, he's one of the major high risk um, kind of people. So if he gets it, chances of survival are very slim. So I'm trying to connect as much as I can with my family while I can. Um, so I think that's really important. And the other thing I'd don't be idle. Keep yourself distracted, whether it's a good TV show, puzzles, a board game, uh, morning meditation, whatever it is. Uh, when you get idle, you start to think too much and you start to kind of feel more trapped, whereas if you can keep yourself busy, um, you know, that's really going to be one of the best methods for kind of getting through this. Uh, we can't just go to the beach. We can't just go and do things that we used to do. So you've got to find new new hobbies, new new things that you enjoy at home. And, and maybe there was always this art class you wanted to do and there's an online version of it or, um, you know, this is the chance to, like, try those things and really work on those things because you've got all this unlimited time now. So, yeah, that would be is regular pattern room and uh, keep yourself busy. Don't let yourself just sort of plump into boredom. Um, and uh, one of my favourite quotes is only boring people, which is so true because if you're not a boring person, then you'll find something to do because there's always stuff you can do. Um, so don't be boring. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Don't be boring. And this is why we're doing this is to, you know, not be boring. And exactly. we've got all this, you know, people have more time. And as Jackie said in the chat, um, she thinks we're probably all getting lots of sleep right now, which is good. But, you know, time to kind of learn and speak to new people and connect and, um, so, yeah, some really good advice. And last question before we kind of take a few from the audience is what's your next, what, what's next for you, Lisa? Any challenges or anything coming up you can tell us about? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously everything's a little bit up in the air <laughs> at the moment given the current um, political climate and all of my sailing is sponsorship driven. So I have to kind of wait and see what happens as far as what, uh, the economic ramifications of this long term. Um, but my intention is for next year uh, to do a speed record from Sydney to Auckland solo and then also that as a training voyage for the boat after the refit before heading off and going around Antarctica again because that's kind of unfinished business for me. So uh, that is definitely on my list and uh, I plan to go and become the fastest person and break the existing speed rate um and then i've got some other crazy plans so you know we'll see what happens um and what what is that speed record what's the um, Antarctica <laughs> speed record at the moment that you need to break yeah so in 2008 a russian sailor fedor konyakov um he went around antarctica on the racetrack that i did in he did it in 102 days. So I was actually one day ahead of his record um, on a, you know, measured basis when uh, I demastered. So I was actually beating his record when the mast came down. So I plan on going back and actually becoming the fastest to it. Nice. Awesome. Okay, well, um, Lisa, hey, thanks so much. I mean, such an interesting story. And I want to give people a chance to ask you some questions as well. So what I'll do... Um, um, Juan, sorry, you're just getting a little bit more read from there for some reason. Juan, you had a question you put in the chat. Do you want to come off mute and ask Lisa directly? Okay. Um, so I... I think I also have video in case you want to see my face. Um, I think if if I am correct, uh, um, I think uh, you did the uh, Clipper Ocean Race a few editions ago. Is that is that right? I think I heard that in the post in the podcast. Yes. Yeah, so I did the Clipper Around the World Yacht Race in 2011, 12 on on board Gold Coast Australia with Richard Hewson, um, Skipper. Question was a little bit. If you had a little bit of time to to talk about that, uh, what made you do it? How you funded that? And if that was your first big ocean sailing, or you had some experience before? 
Yeah, perfect. Uh, great question. Uh, if anyone's looking at a way to try and gain experience in ocean sailing or buildings, can't recommend the Clipper Race anymore. Like it is, it was a life changing event for me. I never would have thought that I would be capable of sailing around the world with crew, let alone on my own. And it was the training and the opportunities given to me by the Clipper Race that actually built that confidence. And, and here we are today. Day, um, you know, as a multi world record holder. So uh, it's definitely a journey to go on. I, 50% of the crew who did the Clip of the World Yacht Race have never sailed before. Um, and out of those people, everyone does a four week compulsory training course uh, before you leave and you learn how to sail the boats and what the positions are. And uh, you do a week of racing with your skipper and, and all of those things. Uh, now, my edition of the race, we did 15 races and we stopped at uh, 11 different countries and, uh, and and 15 different ports. So basically you race from country to country and you in a sea for anywhere on around 20 days to about 35 days was the longest leg of the voyage and that was the North Pacific Ocean. So you really – and you're racing. You're not – is cruising so you're really you don't have the perfect weather windows so you get really exposed to a wide range of conditions the the calmest calms and the you know shit's hitting the fan kind of it's a big ass storm um and uh yeah i mean it's just one hell of an adventure i think one of the hardest things about the race is just the management of all the different people because you have 18 up to 18 people on a boat at never sailed before together, never didn't know each other a couple of weeks ago, uh, and now they're crossing an ocean together and, and they're racing across an ocean. So that um, the sailing part was uh, the easier aspect, uh, but it was also just huge amounts of fun and you build relationships that last forever. Um, as far as my experience when I did the race, I had been working in the Whitsunday Islands as a deck slash host. So that means I was doing all the cooking, but I was also helping the skipper with the sails on a 60-foot yacht um, up there for about a year. And I had a random opportunity to sail with one of my friends from university. Her father was sailing from um, Australia to Hawaii, and they needed someone to jump on board his crew in Samoa. So I flew to Samoa and sailed, and that was my first and only ocean crossing before I did the Clipper race, and I was completely just crew. I'd never used the spinnaker. I really hadn't done a lot of helming. I knew kind of the basics on how to reef a boat or, um, you know, how to pack and dive, but I had never done any navigation. Um, I never looked at a chart before I actually did the Clipper race. So all of the training I got was with the Flipper Race. Um, and then how I funded it, I, uh, I I just tried everything I could. The contract with the Flipper Race is once you sign up to doing the race by signing your contract, and then you have to do monthly payments leading into the race to actually pay your birth fee. And the year I did it uh, for the whole round the world circumnavigation was £40,000. You can do legs of the race, and so you can do a leg of the race, which is, you know, from a country to country, uh, generally around 30 days of sailing, and a leg of the race would be around £5,000, but it was additional £5,000 for your training as well. So you're looking at £10,000 anyway just for one leg of the race. So in my mind, money from nowhere, regardless of what I did. So I thought I'd shoot for the stars and try for the whole circumnavigation, and um, I still have a bit of debt left over from it, but uh, yeah, I um, cycled my bike from Sydney to the Sunshine Coast, selling raffle tickets, riding 100k a day, um, trying to get the media's attention so that I could then try and get sponsorship attention, and um, just tried to do everything I could. We hosted dinners at the um, local yacht club for fifty dollars a head, and I would do presentations talking about my dream to sail around in the Clipper race, and and uh, I'd write to sponsors and try and um, approach companies for sponsorship. I didn't really get any sponsorship. Uh, it's a little difficult from that aspect with the Clipper race because it's a an organized event and you're not allowed to brand the Clipper clothing given to you with sponsors' branding. You can only 
uh, like you have a uniform you have to wear with them and then you have your own clothes around that. So it did limit the opportunities for sponsors as far as, um, you know, exposure and reach and everything. So I wasn't able to close any sponsorship deals uh, for it. Uh, but, yeah, so I just basically fundraised most of it and um, I've got some donations come through from strangers um, that just helped me get across the line. That's awesome. That's a really cool story as well. Like it's just to, um, I think, um, and this is probably um, where Juan's coming from and correct me in the chat if I'm wrong, is, um, yeah, just getting – um, helping people get into sailing and, and seems like, you know, that was a really good way for you to get your experience doing some of that ocean stuff, which is really hard to get. Yeah. If you, you know, if you don't have it, it's like, how do you get it? So um, kind of working your way up. So yeah, really cool story. I'm yeah. just looking at the comments here because there's a couple more questions. Um, Jackie has put to pay it forward to buy your book. So go Jackie. Um, and other Jackie Thanks, has said she's bought the book. So she wants to know when it would be finished. Um, do you know, do you have a date on that yet? Um, I don't have a date. It's coming. It's, I know I've been super slack on that. I'm sorry. I did go and set two, two other big races. Um, so I've just crossed 100,000 words on the writing of it just the other day. All is to actually have it finished in the next two weeks, and then it sits with me for another week for editing, and then it goes to the editor Um Australian Geographic are trying to push it out the door pretty quickly, so we're, we're all kind of full steam ahead on it. Uh, they do print offshore, though, so but I don't know what they'll do in, you know, current year. So that might still be. But um, it's definitely well on its way, and it's going to be such a cool story. So I hope you guys enjoy it. And I think for me it's been quite because I've had to also kind of relive the journey and the failures and the fear and, you know, there's all those situations again. Um, but uh, it's also been quite a therapeutic process right, as well. So, um, yeah, it's got a lot more detail on, on how everything went. Nice. Yeah, that'll be a really good. Another good um, isolation activity, <laughs> read Lisa's book. Is that available on your website? Yeah. I'll put the link to your website in here. Can yeah, we you can order a pre-ordered copy, um, and then they'll just get posted straight to you as soon as it's landed in Australia. And as soon as I have a confirmed release date, I'll be announcing that through social media as well and up on the website, and I'll be emailing everybody who has already bought a book um, to just give you an update on where everything's at um, as soon as I have that confirmed date. So thanks for your patience. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so Kate here had a had a question. Kate, do you want to come off mute and ask your question, or do you want me to just read that out for you? Uh, yeah, look, it was just a little question. I wondered whether you were going to do that speed record to Auckland when the Sydney Auckland race is on in February next year. Um, well, I was actually looking to go September off. Over this year, uh, obviously COVID-19 is kind of throwing those plans out the door. Um, so I haven't really it because it's really going to be subjective to sponsorship. I still need to raise quite a bit of sponsorship for the boat, um, running maintenance and the checks that have to happen on the boat. And She's already sailed almost 20,000 miles since the last refit. Um so she's ready for another move. No matter what kind of project I do, she's going to need quite a big refit anyway. So I'm hoping to get the sponsorship for Antarctica, um, which I would be leaving for in December next year, and use the refit process, get that through July, um, and then do the record to New Zealand and then come back from New Zealand any last kind of preparations required and then head over to Albany for the record around Antarctica again. So that's kind of a loose plan. It's very subjective. Um, and I haven't really thought about tying it in with other events yet because I just don't have a timeline of sponsorship. So I can't kind of guarantee that I would be able to get the sponsorship in time for that date. So that's more my handicap than anything else. All right, thanks. Um, and uh, JT had a question too. So JT, I'll uh, pass it over to you to ask your question. 
Yeah. Um, am I um, alive here now? You are. We can see you. Hi, JT. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah. Hey, Lisa, just loved your presentation. Absolutely fantastic. Um, how do you dodge all those icebergs down there in the Southern Ocean when you're down there that far getting in and out of those, um, around those bergy bits and growlers must be a bit ugly at times. Yeah, thanks for your question. Love your shirt, by the way. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, the <laughs> so I had the lower limit of 60 degrees south for the record. Because I was trying to break federal on your cops record when I really had that kind of plan in motion, the World Sailing Speed Record Council said that I had to travel um, – at the in the same kind of parallels that he had for his record. So he had set himself the ground rules of, of um, once he's on the north of 45 or south of 60 south. Now, most of the icebergs start around 70 south. You do get them traveling north, and they have been all the way up to South Africa before. So there are areas where the um, sort of the Antarctic convergence line where the cold water of Antarctica meets the warmer water of the tropics. Um, it's kind of like this line in the sand almost or in the ocean where the sea temperature changes from um, sort of 6 degrees or 8 degrees and it drops right down to 3 degrees. Now, most icebergs exist in 3 degrees sea temperature. So um, one technique for me for monitoring icebergs was – um, I was getting forecasting done by a company called Zcor, and they're a Canadian-based company, and they do all the iceberg management for the big container ships um, in the northern hemisphere. And it was their off season, and my sponsorship manager was a good, smooth talker. And because uh, they were bored, they decided that they would donate me the iceberg forecasting for my voyage. Uh, it normally costs five thousand dollars a forecast um, to get it purchased. Uh, so that was awesome. So they would basically send me through a Latin long position of what they call a known iceberg. And every known iceberg is an iceberg that's 150 metres in size or greater. Um, and the golden rule is that an iceberg can travel up to three knots, um, so, uh, sorry, three mile in a day. So you've got to kind of extend the search on where it is throughout the day and where it's travelled. And uh, that for every known iceberg, there's up to 50 unknown icebergs within a 200 nautical mile range of that one known iceberg. Um, I would get this kind of chart of Latin long positions and I'd plot them on my um, plotter and then I would look at how far I was from these icebergs and I effectively put myself in exclusion zones and I would exclude the 200 meter line from any known iceberg and I'd stay to the north of that line and um, I was also using my radar um, so I have a 4G PNG 4G digital radar and I also was using my sea temperature um, gauge because if I came into a cold patch there was a high chance of ice being in that patch if I had a swell from the um, Antarctic convergence line come up or I was coming up on a massive block of ice. So I effectively set alarms. So if I had a rapid drop in sea temperature from 8 degrees to 3 degrees, uh, then I would have a few seconds to just hit the crash tack button on the autopilot and try and halt the boat's movement um, and then hopefully get on deck and, and assess the situation from there. Um, I also just, in when I was near areas um, of high risk, so there was a couple of areas where, um, I was within 150 nautical miles of an iceberg at one point because I couldn't get further from it or I'd void the record. And um, I basically just stayed at the radar and I slept 10-minute naps for three days straight until I cleared that zone. And I slowed the boat down so I kept my reefs in the main uh, so that my boat speed was less than five knots through that zone it, it kept me there longer, but it also meant that if an impact occurred, I had less risk of um, extreme damage being done. Um, so that was kind of some of my game plans around iceberg management. But, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was just basically extreme sleep deprivation and um, hope.
because there was such extreme fog around at the time. You couldn't, like, keep a lookout properly. You just had to rely on instruments. There was, I could see maybe 50 metres from the boat if I was lucky um, through that whole area. So, yeah, it's a bit of a risk. Wow, that's pretty amazing, actually. Um, and it's interesting about the known icebergs, unknown icebergs as well. So I've never, that's something new for me anyway. Um, we've got a question from Jackie about the loneliest island in the world. Jackie, I'm going to take you off mute so that you can ask your question. Oh, no, you need to take yourself off mute, actually. <laughs> no. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Am I there? Yeah, we can hear you. You are there. Okay. Now Firstly. Hi, Jackie. Hey. Hey guys, uh, firstly, Deb, oh yeah, my t-shirt, uh, firstly, Deb, uh, wonderful that you put this together, Deb, it's, um, it's great, so we'll take this out of isolation for at least, you know, a couple of hours, yeah, exactly. which we all needed to do, um, but yeah, uh, I've heard Lisa's, a few of Lisa's stories, and I think uh, one that's fascinating is this, this little tiny island deep in the southern uh, ocean. And I've forgotten its name, so you'll have to remind me. Uh, or did I dream that? No, you're right. It's not an island that's called Point Nemo. Is that what you're that's referring it. to? That's it, Point Nemo. The furthest. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's the furthest that you can get from land anywhere in the world. And it, at any one single moment in time, you're over 1,500 nautical miles of landmass, and that landmass is a whole little island that's 30 miles long and 10 miles wide, and is uninhabited in the Pacific Ocean. So Point Nemo is kind of, I would say it's maybe three quarters or two thirds of the way across the Pacific Ocean on the way to South America, and, um, and it's literally just a dot in the ocean, but what happens is because you're so remote, you end up actually being closer to the astronauts in space than any person on any point of land anywhere in the world. Um, so it's it's just like one of the most remote areas in the planet. And, yeah, I mean, we had the pleasure of sailing through Point Nemo. So, um, yeah, it, it's there's nothing there. It's just blue water. <laughs> and uh, there's just one more thing I'd yeah. like to add, probably to Deb as well. Um, yeah. that, you know, this is this is a fantastic opportunity that you're giving everybody to listen to your story. But it'd be great if it wasn't in those uh, pesky news channel um, traffic, uh, because I think we'd get more people on online, you know, to to listen to your story. And and obviously, Deb, you're going to continue doing these. Uh, what do you call them? Video chats. So yep, uh, it would be great if we could hear Lisa's story again on another night. Is that possible? Ah, well, that's up to Lisa, yeah. No, so I do apologise. The technology is probably not as good as it could be, so it's something uh, I would try one. I think one Zoom's to better. I'm not sure. But um, I've heard that. But, but um, yeah. Also probably my for internet. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of people kind of on Netflix in the evenings these days. So, um, But, yeah, look, um, Jackie, definitely if you've got ideas of people you'd like to hear from or things you'd like to hear about, let me know. Um, and if Lisa wants to come and talk again, then she'd definitely be more than welcome. Um, I'm sure she has tons of other stuff to tell us. Um, and yeah, hopefully this doesn't can go definitely on too do another long. session. Yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be super cool. Okay. I can tell you guys else? all the failure points of sailing solo around Australia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool, actually. That'd be really top relevant. Um, uh, especially, well, we do have people, I know we've had some people joining us from New Zealand, um, and we have people from across Australia. And I don't know if we have anyone from anywhere else at the moment. Probably not because of the time zone, but... Um, uh, yeah, we definitely have some members in on my sale who are from other places, so maybe we'll listen in or watch in tomorrow. Um, so a couple of people have just said thank you, and so if there's no more questions, I think maybe we'll wrap it up, um, unless anybody pops another question in in the next minute, or on Lisa, if you have anything else you wanted to add. Not really. I just wanted to, you know, 
it's it's really cool. Uh, this is a cool opportunity for people to really pick my brains as well. So if you do have questions, um, don't be shy. Uh, that's what this whole thing's about. It's an open chat. So, um, you know, ask away. Um, but, yeah, I think uh, that's really cool. Check out the website, any new projects and things like that. I'll be posting those all through my social media. So everything that I have surrounding my projects is all just Lisa Blair Sales the World. Um, so social pages and uh, website are all the same name. And, um, yeah, uh, check out the book online. And, and we do have the documentary coming out. Uh, we're just in the final wrap-up stage. So they should be hopefully finished over the quarantine period is kind of the goal. Um and then uh, they've got to sell it to market. So it could be a little while till it's actually at your door, but hopefully this year that'll be out as well, and um, that'll be a really cool. I've listened to the audio cut from it um, that the filmmakers have been putting together, and, uh, yeah, I'm really impressed. So that's something to look forward to uh, at the other end of things. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. And, uh, you yeah, know, the video looks exciting and definitely um, I'm going to get online and pre-order one of your books. I should have done it already, but um, I'll do it now. And so I've <laughs> put that link in there if anybody else wants to. Um, and, yeah, so we'll wrap it up. I'll leave the the um, system on for a minute just while everyone logs out in case anyone had a question, had anything they wanted to ask me in the chat. Um, but, yeah, hope to speak to everyone next week. Same time, same place. Thanks everyone for tuning in. If you'd like to know more about this program or the MyCell app and community, head on over to MyCell.team. That's M-Y-S-A-I-L dot T-E-A-M. Until next time, stay safe and happy sailing.